The dark story of the Maxwell family doesn't start with allegations against Ghislaine Maxwell and her friend Jeffrey Epstein. No, the lies, deceit, and dark practices of Ghislaine's father is where the real story began. As a prominent publisher and businessman, Robert Maxwell would create an empire only to see it all crumble right before his own death. Today, the story of Robert Maxwell on the dark side of Wikipedia. Sometimes the human mind goes to dark places. Sometimes those dark delusions turn into reality. A reality so shaded and gray, once all is said and done, the healthy mind is drawn into the documented retelling of these tragic events, trying to find logic, reason, and understanding where there may be none at all. This is the dark side of Wikipedia. Ian Robert Maxwell was a British media proprietor, member of Parliament, suspected spy, and fraudster. Originally from Czechoslovakia, Maxwell rose from poverty to build an extensive publishing empire. After his death, huge discrepancies in his company's finances were revealed, including his fraudulent misappropriation of the Mir Group Pension Fund. Early in his life, Maxwell, an Orthodox Jew, escaped from Nazi occupation, joined the Czechoslovakian army in exile during World War II, and was decorated after active service in the British Army. In subsequent years, he worked in publishing, building up Pergamon Press to a major publishing house. After six years as a labor MP during the 1960s, Maxwell again put all his energies into business, successfully buying the British printing corporation Mirror Group newspapers and Macmillan Publishers, along with other publishing companies. Maxwell had a flamboyant lifestyle living in Headington Hill Hall in Oxford, from which he often flew in his helicopter and sailed in his luxury yacht, the Lady Ghislaine. He was litigious and often embroiled in controversy, including with regard to his support for Israel at the time of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. In 1989, Maxwell had to sell his successful business, including Pergamon Press, to cover some of his debts. In 1991, his body was discovered floating in the Atlantic Ocean, having fallen overboard from his yacht. He was buried in Jerusalem. Maxwell's death triggered the collapse of his publishing empire as banks called in loans. His sons briefly attempted to keep the business together but failed as the news emerged that the elder Maxwell had stolen hundreds of millions of pounds from his own company's pension funds. The Maxwell's company applied for bankruptcy protection in early 1992. So here we go, continuing on the saga. This would be like the prequel, if you will, uh, to uh, the Epstein case and the allegations against Ghislaine Maxwell. These are not only really allegations here against Robert Maxwell. These are flat out, you know, facts. These are things that were, uh, you know, he was caught at. He died. Um, Sounds like he was probably about to get caught and died. Uh, I don't know if it was suicide, and we will get more into that later in the show. Uh, but I, I don't know a ton about this, but I knew that there was some crooked stuff going on. And I thought, well, let's see just how far the apple fell from the tree. When we talk about Ghislaine Maxwell, let's go and dig into the world of Robert Maxwell, since it's so well documented. And uh, yeah, makes for a great, interesting episode of uh, Dark Side of Wikipedia. Tony and Sean joining you today. And how are you this fine day? Yeah, I'm doing great. And I'll tell you what, why I'm doing great. The day we're recording this, it is somebody's birthday. (laughs) Happy birthday to you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're recording this on uh, August 5th, and I think it's probably airing in, like, September. <laughs> so. so when you're listening to this, the day it comes out, you're, like, six weeks late on wishing Tony a happy birthday. But just wanted to sneak that in there. Moving on, I yeah. will say around this time that we're recording this and during this pandemic that the Jeffrey Epstein story and all that he has to offer, not so good. You have to really wonder, at least when I watched that program, mm-hmm. Why is that girl with him? 
why is she that Maxwell lady? Wh- yeah. Why is she dealing with this? And we're finding out very quickly here. If you have some fucked up stuff in your life from an early age, or in this case, your dad, you know, you can see a, a guy like old Jeff, old Jeff Epstein. He's a, uh, he's someone you want in your life. I wonder how much, uh, Epstein reminded her of dad. Mm. Uh, if there's some daddy things there, I don't know. I mean, I, it's all speculation, uh, as to what that is, but obviously there is a very corrupt father in the picture here of someone who then later got herself into a lot of alleged trouble and, uh, associations with people that are, you know, not so much on the up and up. And you have to wonder, I mean, if, if your life is spent around someone, your upbringing years is spent around someone who also kind of surrounds themselves with unsavory tactics, individuals and, and such, that's kind of your norm. And so when someone, you know, points out and, and judges you or says, hey, this is, you know, not a great idea. Or this is not a great person. Your compass is already pretty fucked up. I mean, it's not an excuse for her by any means, but I, I like to try and jump into the world of how is this person operating and doing this? Because clearly it, you look at it and go from an outside perspective, why on earth would you be involved with someone like this? And you go, well. There, there's something not right with them and their compass is fucked up. And it doesn't always necessarily take a mental illness, but it can certainly take years of conditioning from a certain perspective or abuse or trauma. Or I don't know if there was any of that involved with him, but um, with with her father. But um, certainly the compass can be fucked up from years of conditioning a certain way. And, and we'll dig in deeper to find out if there is more to that. But um, it's uh, that's what happens. Uh, you, you get a fucked up compass and north is south and south and east is west. And you, you don't know what the fuck you're doing to a certain extent. As much as you do do, you do know what you're doing. What you think is right is not. And then try living a life. But what I think what I think is very interesting and, and uh, both of us not being psychology majors, but I think if we do go back to school, I think both <laughs> of us would would want to go into that. Yeah. Everybody has memories from childhood, whether it's going fishing with dad or whether it's helping mom make pancakes every Sunday morning before church or whether it's in my case, listen to the, the baseball game. I have fond memories of wherever we would go with my daddy. I was listening to the baseball game. So fast forward to current life. I enjoy reminiscing a bit when I'm listening to uh, sports on the radio or baseball game. Mm-hmm. If you had a situation where maybe it wasn't as positive uh, from an outsider's view growing up, oh my God, your, your parents, what did they do with you? Or yeah. what what did you do with them? In a child's mind, as we're learning as a, a young human, we don't necessarily know this is very wrong. Yeah. This is, this is, this is not good. We should be listening to the baseball game on the radio with one of our parents. So fast forward to adult life in a very weird way. And again, this is where knowing a little bit more about the human brain, you almost miss that. You almost miss those childhood memories, even though it was insanely wrong and screwed up and weird and creepy and out there and technically illegal, possibly in some cases that you say with, with Jeffrey Epstein, if he reminds her, he would almost comfort her well, dad was so fucked up when I was seven. So is he. Yeah. Let's hang out. And that's what's very scary and interesting. And you almost feel sad for people in that mental state. Yeah, I mean, there, you have to have a certain amount of empathy for it. But I mean, at the same point, you have to, you know, it's not it's not outright just, oh, poor you. It's like you're a grown up and, and you can make decisions and you could. You you had plenty of opportunities. This individual had plenty of opportunities. Ghislaine, I believe, had plenty of opportunities to say, you know what, I need to change something. This wasn't right. Uh, you'd at least have an inkling that maybe things aren't right in a certain way, and you have to take the initiative to change. Um, and and I, clearly, I don't think that that, that happened. I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's my... Uh, take on it. I mean, another example, a quick one before we continue on would be uh, one that I learned personally um, from childhood. And I never had, I didn't like really have a lot of trauma in this situation I'm about to talk about, but it was just, it was such a normal thing. Uh, Growing up in the state of Wisconsin, we would be almost every Friday and Saturday night, I'd be sitting at a bar 
uh, you know, and then we go have dinner. It wasn't like my parents were taking me out to the bar till 2 a.m. or anything. But from like five to seven, I'm sitting at a bar uh, from the age that I can walk to, you know, the age that I didn't want to hang out with my parents anymore. Um, it was, you know, Friday night fish fry. It was this or that. But you go to a supper club or a restaurant and the first thing you do there is you go sit at a bar and there's a lot of people talking loud and they're drunk and they're drinking and everybody's just pounding back double bubbles because it's two for one. And hey, it must count as one when, you know, everybody has a few rounds. And, and I don't really have any memories of my parents being drunk or anything like that. I don't. My parents were not, uh, you know, alcoholics or anything like that. Um, but that was just, it's a weird, warm, fuzzy to have as a child remembering sitting at a bar. And, you know, late, you, know you tell people that story later in life in other states and they're like, you have this weird, like, disposition of, like, warm and fuzzies from sitting at a bar where, like, others have, like, horrible memories of their parents dragging them into, like, bars because they're raging alcoholics or this or that. And it's like, and, and later in life, too, I did end up drinking too much and I ended up quitting drinking because I just I thought this this could go down a bad road fast. Um, so I switched to something else that we won't mention on the program today. Uh, that's not as harmful. Um, and it's. It, it, it's just, you know, it's, it, but to me, it was a norm. And, and to me, no matter what, no matter how many horrible stories I hear about abuse of alcohol, and I know it can be absolutely horrible. Um, I have a grandfather who essentially died of it eventually because uh, he pickled himself, but I don't know how the hell long he, how he lived as long as he did. Um, but, um, it's it, there will always be a conditioned part of me that still thinks of that warm, fuzzy supper club with the video game in the corner and everybody's kind of laughing and having a good time. It's just there. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a great idea for everyone. And that's it, it, it's a conditioning thing. And that's a very light, I guess, somewhat version of, you know, comparing this to the Maxwell family. But it is conditioning. And and then what you're conditioned to view as warm and fuzzy, um, you know, it, it takes some perspective to look back on it at some point and go, maybe that's not the best idea for your kids. <laughs> <laughs> or how you want to handle things. I mean, wouldn't you agree from being a Wisconsin person too of seeing a lot of that? I think it's very unique, absolutely. Growing up, and and I think everyone centered in whatever part of the country uh, you grew up in. Uh, I didn't grow up uh, catching catfish in the Mississippi River, just going out yeah. on a boat and and just sticking my hand down. Uh, I also have, I think, a higher threshold of people drinking everywhere. You grew up about an hour and a half north of me. I grew up in uh, closer to uh, Milwaukee, where I think anything and everything was a reason to celebrate, to yeah. eat uh, copious amounts of brats and drink a lot of beer. And when you have those lists that come out, the top 10 drunkest cities in America, <laughs> not a fluke that seven of 10 uh, have a WI <laughs> after the city. There's uh, a lot of alcohol consumption. I'd like to think that because of that, people, um, I don't want to say that they were more cognitive drunks, mm -hmm. but I think they were a little bit more responsible. But you talk to people in other places that come into your life and they kind of look at you a little bug eyed thinking, what, what, wait, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. What? what? <laughs> What's normal it, for you? It, yeah. It, uh, yes. And I think, I mean, you grew up in Colorado, you were six years old climbing mountains. Yeah. You grew up in Wisconsin, you're six years old. This is called a Shirley Temple. Yeah, and you're playing, uh, no, it's a kitty cocktail in a lot of A kitty time. cocktail yeah. and you're playing Royal Rummy. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's just, it's it's very, uh, I'm proud, I'm happy. Yeah. I don't, um, I didn't grow up in a, uh, in a, in a crap place and want to run away as yeah. quick as humanly possible. But sure. it's just a different spotlight, a yeah. different angle, what you're accustomed to, what yeah. you, what you grew up with and. Um, the different norm. And then sometimes those norms you, you realize later in life really shouldn't be the norm. And <laughs> you kind of got to do a little, little readjusting of the, uh, of the, the compass there. Let's, uh, let's continue into this story and see what was the norm in the world of the Maxwells. Maxwell was born into a poor Yiddish speaking Orthodox Jewish family in a small town in the easternmost province of pre-World War II Czechoslovakia. His parents were Michelle Hoke and Hannah Slomowitz. 
He had six siblings. In 1939, the area was reclaimed by Hungary. Most members of his family died in Auschwitz after Hungary was occupied in 1944 by Nazi Germany. But he had years earlier escaped to France. In Marcel, he joined the Czechoslovakian army in exile in May of 1940. After the fall of France and the British retreat to Britain, Maxwell, using the name Ivan de Muray or Leslie de Muray, the surname taken from the popular uh, cigarette brand de Muray, took part in the protest against the leadership of Czechoslovakian army with 500 other soldiers. He was then transferred to the Pioneer Corps, uh, later to the North Staffordshire Regiment in 1943. He was then involved in action across Europe from Normandy beaches to Berlin and achieved the rank of sergeant. Maxwell gained a commission in 1945 and was promoted to the rank of captain. In January 1945, Maxwell's heroism in storming a German machine gun nest during the war won him the Military Cross, presented by Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. Attached to the Foreign Office, he served in Berlin during the next two years. In the press section, Maxwell naturalized as a British subject on the 19th of June, 1946, and changed his name by deed of change of name on June 30th, 1948. In 1945, Maxwell married Elizabeth Betty Menard, a French Protestant, and the couple had nine children over the next 16 years. Michael, Philip, Anne, Christine, Karen, Ian, Kevin, and Ghislaine. In a 1995 interview, Elizabeth talked of how they were recreating his childhood family, victims of the Holocaust. Five of his children, Christine, Isabel, Ian, Kevin, and Ghislaine were later employed within his companies. Daughter Karen died of leukemia at age three while Michael was severely injured in a car crash in 1961 at the age of 15 when his driver fell asleep at the wheel. Michael never regained consciousness and died seven years later. After the war, Maxwell used contacts in the Allied occupation authorities to go into business, becoming the British and U.S. distributor for Springer Verlag, a publisher of scientific books. In 1951, he brought, bought three quarters of Buttersworth Springer, a minor publisher. The remaining quarter was held by the experienced scientific editor Paul Rosebud. They changed the name of the company to Pergamon Press and rapidly built it into a major publishing house. In 1964, representing the Labour Party, Maxwell was elected as Member of Parliament for Buckingham and re-elected in 1966. He gave an interview to the Times in 1968 in which he said the House of Commons provided him with a problem. I can't get on with the men, he commented. I've tried having male assistants at first, but it didn't work. They tend to be too independent. Men like to have individuality. Women can become an extension of the boss. Maxwell lost his seat in 1970 to the conservative William Benyon. He contested Buckingham again in both 1974, the general elections, but without success. At the beginning of 1969, it emerged that Maxwell's attempt to buy the tabloid newspaper News of the World had failed. The Carr family, which owned the title, was incensed at the thought of a Czechoslovakian immigrant with socialist politics gaining ownership and the board voted against Maxwell's bid without any dissent. The News of the World's editor, Stafford Summerfield, opposed Maxwell's bid in, the, uh, in October of 1968 with a front-page opinion piece in which he referred to Maxwell's Czechoslovakian origins as and used his birth name. He wrote, This is a British paper run by British people, as British as roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. Let us keep it that way. The tycoon who gained control was the Australian Rupert Murdoch, who later that year acquired the Sun, which had also previously interested Maxwell. Pergamon lost and regained in 1969. Saul Steinberg, head of Losco Data Processing Corporation, he was interested in a strategic acquisition of Pergamon Press. Steinberg claimed that during negotiations, Maxwell falsely stated that a subsidiary responsible for publishing encyclopedias was extremely profitable. At the same time, Pergamon had been forced to reduce its profit forecast for 1969 from 2.5 million to 2.05 million during the period of negotiations and dealing in Pergamon shares was suspended on the London stock markets. Maxwell subsequently lost control of Pergamon and was expelled from the board in October 1969, along with three other directors in sympathy with him but the majority owners of the company's shares. Steinberg purchased Pergamon, an inquiry by the Department of Trade and 
industry under the takeover code of the time reported in the mid-1971, stating, we regret having to conclude that notwithstanding Mr. Maxwell's acknowledged abilities and energy, he is not, in our opinion, a person who can be relied on to exercise proper stewardship of a publicly quoted company. It was found that Maxwell had contrived to maximize Pergamon's share price through transactions between his private family's companies. At the same time, the United States Congress was investigating Lasco's takeover practices. Justice Tane Forbes in September of 1971 was critical of the inquiry. They had moved from an inquisitorial role to an accusatory one and virtually committed the business murder of Mr. Maxwell. He further continued that the trial judge would probably find that the inspectors had acted contrary to the rules of natural justice. The company performed poorly under Steinberg. Maxwell reacquired Pergamon in 1974 after borrowing funds. Maxwell established the Maxwell Foundation in Liechtenstein in 1970. He acquired the British Printing Corporation in 1981 and changed its name to the British Printing and Communication Corporate, Corporation and then to the Maxwell Communications Corporation. The company was later sold to the management buyout and is now known as Polestar. Later business activities. In July of 1984, Maxwell acquired Mirror Group newspapers, the publisher of six British newspapers, including the Daily Mirror, the Reed International PLC, for $113 million. This led to the famous media war between Maxwell and Murdoch, the proprietor of News of the World and The Sun. Mirror Group newspapers, formerly Trinity Mirror, now part of Reach PLC, published the Daily Mirror and pro-labor tabloid Sunday Mirror. Sunday People, Scottish Sunday Mail, and Scottish Daily Record. At a press conference, the publicist and his acquisition, Maxwell said his editors would be free to produce the news without interference. Meanwhile, at a meeting of Maxwell's new employees, Mirror journalist Joe Haynes asserted that he was able to prove that their boss is a crook and a liar. Haynes quickly came under Maxwell's influence and later wrote his authorized biography. In June of 1985, Maxwell announced a takeover of Clive Sinclair's ailing home computer company, Sinclair Research, through Hollis Brothers, a Pergamon subsidiary. The deal was aborted in August of 1985. In 1987, Maxwell purchased part of IPC Media to create Fleetway Publications. The same year, he launched the London Daily News in February after a delay caused by production problems, but the paper closed in July after sustaining significant losses. Contemporary estimates put it at $25 million. At first intended to be a rival of the Evening Standard, Maxwell had made a rash decision for it to be the first 24-hour paper as well. By 1988, Maxwell's various companies owned, in addition to the Mirror, Titles, and Pergamon Press, Nimbus Records, Maxwell Directories, Prentice Hall Information Services, and Berlitz Language Schools. He also owned a half share of MTV in Europe and other European television interests, the Maxwell Cable TV and Maxwell Entertainment. Maxwell purchased Macmillan Publishers, the American firm, during 1988 for $2.6 billion. In the same year, he launched an ambitious new project, transitional newspaper called The European. In 1991, he was forced to sell Pergamon and Maxwell directors to Elsevier for $440 million to cover his debts. He used some of this money to buy an ailing tabloid, the New York Daily News. The same year, Maxwell sold 49% of the stock of Mir Group newspapers to the public. Maxwell's links with Eastern European totalitarian regimes resulted in several biographies, generally considered to be hiographies of those countries' leaders with interviews conducted by Maxwell for which he received much derision. At the beginning of an interview with Romania's Nicolae Saușescu, then the country's communist leader, he asked, how do you account for your enormous popularity with the Roman people? For the last 32 years of his life, Robert Maxwell lived in Headington Hill Hall, which he rented from Oxford City Council and described as the best council house in the country. It is now part of Oxford Brooks University. Maxwell was also the chairman of Oxford United, saving them from bankruptcy and attempting to merge them with Reading in 1983 to form a club he wished to call Thames Valley Royals. He took Oxford into the top flight of English football in 1985, and the team won the League Cup a year later. 
Maxwell bought into Derby Country in 1987. He also attempted to buy Manchester United in 1984, but refused owner Martin Edwards' asking price. Maxwell was known to be litigious against those who would speak or write against him. The satirical magazine Private Eye lampooned him as Captain Bob and the Bouncing Check, the later nickname having originally been devised by Prime Minister Harold Wilson. Maxwell took out several libel actions against Private Eye, one resulting in the magazine losing an estimated $225,000 and Maxwell using his commercial power to hit back with a one-off spoof magazine, not Private Eye. So, he sounds like an extremely shrewd business person. One where you almost have to kind of have the kill them all attitude or take no prisoners attitude. I think to really do the amount of things that he did or shit that he did, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, you know, there's the world of folks out there that, that own and operate some of these things. And, and none of them are really necessarily known as warm, fuzzy individuals. Uh, it's more like, you know, if they weren't doing this within the business community, they might be trying to take over countries. Um, so, I guess that's what works in his favor. It mainly just happened in the publishing world, but uh, probably not in my guesstimation, not the dad you cuddle up with on the couch at night and, and read a uh, uh, Berenstein bears book with. Yeah. I, I don't think this guy's a lot of best friends. Uh, he's not a warm and cuddly teddy bear um, with, uh, with his kids, I would imagine, but you know, I don't think a lot of shrewd businessmen or women uh, are no. very focused on their ventures. And how about that MTV in Europe? Hello. Yeah, I want my MTV. So he was, I mean, it, it, he, he had his hand in so many different things as ownership. And I guess once you have that level of money, you know, you're kind of just, it's like all the world is a deck of cards and all these businesses are cards and you're kind of, you're trading them back and forth. And, you know, these are, you know, literally thousands, if not millions of people's lives and livelihoods that are then dependent on how the leaders, the individuals play their hand um, will somehow affect the lives of all of those below them. I mean, that's business 101, but it, it, it truly is, you know, that, that that's the reality of it. And, and I, I think there's a reflection then sometimes in companies when you have leadership that is like this, that then the it, 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 it does trickle down into uh, especially the higher ups in management probably, who work directly and see directly to him have to kind of have a certain persona. And then below that, everybody, it, it's a game of mimicking. It's, it's what people do. It's what animals do, um, you know, to try and survive. You mimic the one that you're trying to be like, or you, that you view as the leader or that you're supposed to be. And it, the mimicking is just a way of showing your, you know, subordinates or, or your agreement or that you're on the same page as that other individual. So I can only imagine what the atmosphere must have been like in some of those companies uh, with, uh, with with a leader like that. It's, uh, it's very interesting. And um, I'm kind of excited to kind of see how this uh, rolls on and ultimately, uh, ultimately ends in his, in his death. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested as we continue in here uh, into the uh, Robert Maxwell story. I just I, I want to note this and I normally don't note odd things on this show, but it's kind of odd. I have a, a hummingbird staring at me through my window right now. It is just hovering there listening to the story of Robert Maxwell. So it's a very uh, <laughs> excitable hummingbird. <laughs> I, I believe, is, that, is that Gerald? That son of a bitch, she likes to play staring contests on Wednesdays. I, I have a hummingbird feeder outside of the studio window a little ways out there, and I have not refilled it in about a week because every time I think of it, I have to go to the shed, which is that locked. That's what he's saying. Yeah, he yo, wants he wants yo, more human, syrup. So. Give me food. Yeah, he wants me to refill the feeder. Uh, and he's he like, oh, crap about Robert Max. Your office window is open. I'm going to stand here and stare at you and, and hover while you read about horrible people. So, OK, let's continue on. Hummingbird, I will get to you shortly. But first, we need to talk about Robert Maxwell before you get fed. So 
There you go. That's a, a sentence I you never thought you'd have to say to to nature. Uh, continuing on. A hint of Maxwell's service to the Israeli state was provided by John Loftus and Mark Ahrens, who described Maxwell's contacts with Czechoslovakian communist leaders in 1948 as crucial to the Czechoslovak decision to arm Israel in the 1948 Arab-Israeli war. Czechoslovak military assistance was, was both unique and crucial for the fledgling state as it battled for its existence. It was Maxwell's covert help in smuggling aircraft parts into Israel that led to the country having air superiority during their 1948 War of Independence. The Foreign Office suspected that Maxwell was a secret agent of a foreign government, possibly a double agent or triple agent, and a thoroughly bad character and almost certainly financed by Russia. Maxwell had known links to the British secret intelligence service, MI6, and the Soviet KGB, and to the Israeli intelligence service, Mossad. Six serving and former heads of Israeli intelligence services attended Maxwell's funeral in Israel, while Israeli, while Israeli Prime Minister Yatzik Shamir eulogized him and stated he has done more for Israel than can today be said. Shortly before Maxwell's death, the former employee of Israel of Israel's military intelligence, Ari Ben Menshi, approached a number of news organizations in Britain and the U.S. with the allegations that Maxwell and the Daily Mirror's foreign editor Nicholas Davies were both longtime agents for Mossad. Ben Masani also claimed that in 1986, Maxwell had told the Israeli embassy in London that Maradachi Vanu had given information about Israeli's nuclear capability to the Sunday Times, then to the Daily Mirror. Vanu was, subsequent, was subsequently kidnapped by Mossad and smuggled to Israel, convicted of treason and imprisoned for 18 years. Ben Menashe's story was ignored at first, but eventually the New Yorker journalist Seymour Hirsch reported and repeated some of the allegations during a press conference in London held to publicize the Samson option, Hirsch's book about Israeli's nuclear weapon. In October of 1991, Labor MP George Galloway and conservative MP Rupert Allison, known in his, as author Nigel West, agreed to raise the issue in the House of Commons under parliamentary privilege protection, which in turn allowed British newspapers to report events without fear of libel suits. Maxwell called the claims ludicrous, a total invention, and sacked Davies. A year later, in Galloway's libel settlement against Mirror Group newspapers, in which he received substantial damages, Galloway's counsel announced that the MP accepted that the group staff had not been involved in Van Nuys abduction. Galloway referred to Maxwell as one of the worst criminals in the country. On the 4th of November, 1991, Maxwell had an argumentative phone call with his son, Kevin, over a meeting scheduled with the Bank of England on Maxwell's default of $50 million in loans. Maxwell missed the meeting, instead traveling to his yacht, Lady Ghislaine, in the Canary Islands. On the 5th of November, Maxwell was last in contact with the crew of the Lady Ghislaine at 4.25 a.m. local time, but was found to be missing later in the morning. It had been speculated that Maxwell was urinating into the ocean nude at the time, as he often did. Maxwell was presumed to have fallen overboard from the vessel, which was cruising off the Canary Islands. His naked body was recovered from the Atlantic Ocean and then taken to Las Palmes. Besides a graze to his left shoulder, there were no noticeable wounds on Maxwell's body. The official ruling at an inquest held in December of 1991 was death by a heart attack combined with accidental drowning, although three pathologists had been unable to agree on the cause of his death at the inquest. He had been found to have been suffering from serious heart and lung conditions. Murder was ruled out by the judge, and in effect, so was suicide. His son discounted the possibility of suicide, saying, I think it's highly unlikely that he would have taken his own life. It wasn't in his makeup or his mentality. Maxwell was accorded a lavish funeral in Israel attended by Israeli Prime Minister Yatzik Shamir, Israeli President Chim Herzog, no less than six serving and former heads of Israeli intelligence and many dignitaries and politicians, both governmental and opposition, and was buried on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Herzog delivered the eulogy and Kaddish was 
recited by his fellow Holocaust survivor, friend and longtime attorney Samuel Pissar. British Prime Minister John Major has said Maxwell had given him valuable insights into the situation in the Soviet Union during an attempted coup of 1991. He was a great character, Major added. Neil Kinnock, then Labour Party leader, spoke of him as a man with a zest for life who attracted controversy, envy, and loyalty in great measure throughout his life. A production crew conducted research for Maxwell, a biographical film of the, by the BBC uncovered tapes stored in a suitcase owned by his former head of security, John Pohl. Later in his life, Maxwell had become increasingly paranoid of his own employees and had the offices of those he suspected of disloyalty wired so he could hear their conversations. After Maxwell's death, the tapes remained in Pohl's suitcase and were discovered by the researchers only in 2007. Maxwell's death triggered a flood of instability with banks frantically calling in their massive loans. His son Kevin and Ian struggled to hold the empire together but were unable to prevent its collapse. It emerged that without adequate prior authorization, Maxwell had used hundreds of millions of pounds from his company's pensions funds to shore up the shares of the Mirror Group to save his companies from bankruptcy. Eventually, the pension funds were replenished with money from investment banks, Shearson Lehman, and Goldman Sachs, as well as the British government. This replenishment was limited and also supported by the surplus in the printer's fund, which was taken by the government in part payment of $100 million required to support the workers' state pensions. The rest of the $100 million was waived. Maxwell's theft of pension funds was therefore partially repaid from public funds. The result was that, in general, pensioners received about 50% of their company's pension entitlement. The Maxwell companies filed for bankruptcy protection in 1992. Kevin Maxwell was declared bankrupt with debts of $400 million. In 1995, Kevin, Ian, and two other former directors went on trial for conspiracy to defraud, but were unanimously acquitted by a 12-man jury in 1996. In November of 1994, Maxwell's widow, Elizabeth, published her memoirs, A Mind of My Own, A Life with Robert Maxwell, which sheds light on her life with Maxwell when the publishing magnet was ranked as one of the richest people in the world. Having earned her degree from Oxford University in 1991, she devoted much of her later life to continued research on the Holocaust and worked as a proponent of Jewish-Christian dialogue. She died on August 7th of 2013. In July of 2020, Maxwell's youngest daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell, was arrested and charged with six federal crimes, including transportation of a minor to engage in criminal sexual activity and conspiracy to entice minors to travel to engage in illegal sex acts, allegedly arising out of her operating of a sex trafficking ring with Jeffrey Epstein. So there you go, parents, dads. If you live your life like that, your daughter will become involved as a madam in a alleged madam in a uh, child sex trafficking ring. Just so you know, when you're working hard out there, that's what's going to happen. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, that's, you know, it's interesting. And I really wonder, and this is just me. This is just my suspicions. This is just my guesses. Um, but we're in a world now, thankfully, where child sex rings and abuse of women and sexual abuse and all that and is, is very much not tolerated in any way, shape or form. But for so many years, it was not only tolerated, it was like the norm amongst, and, and probably to this day in many places, it still probably is. But in, in the public as a whole, it's at least gotten a hell of a lot more scrutinized than it used to be. But we're talking a world, you know, Mad Men type style world that this man was a part of. You got to wonder, a guy like that, how involved was he in the with the Jeffrey Epstein's of the day uh, in his time? Not Epstein directly, but the folks who would have been essentially playing that type of role. Maybe not exactly like Epstein, but playing that role with other powerful men because he was a powerful man. And how much did did Ghislaine, you know, see of that growing up? It's just a, it's a guess. It's an assumption. It's 
it's, you know, I don't know. It's just an opinion more than anything else. What are your thoughts? I think once you open up that uh, door, it creates so many possible angles and such. I, and I think in what we read, pretty good at, at finding information and fact finding. So I think that uh, upon his death and moving on, that more information would come out. So I'm going to side with, even though a lot more happened and it wasn't as vigilant and people didn't care as much to bring it to light of, of um, heinous acts, I, I don't think. I think he was involved with a lot. I don't. I guess I'd like to give him the benefit of the doubt. What I would say is, what a crappy way to die. You're out on a boat <laughs> taking a leak naked, and then you're dead. And you fall off, and that's how it ends for you. It's and just such a, a heart attack and accidental drowning. Well, yeah, because you're... I mean, I, I would like to think you're not 100% sober if you're nude on your yacht taking a leak into the ocean. You probably have had a few kitty cocktails, and then you, <laughs> you slip, and oh, fuck! I'm naked, I'm in an ocean, and then you start to have a panic attack, and you have a heart attack, and then you're you're gone. So, I, I maybe there was some shady going on, but I I guess I'm going to side with that it wasn't in in that realm of shady. It was more mm. so just shrewd, uh, business shady. Yeah, uh, I I don't feel the need to play a clip from Michael Jackson's Gone Too Soon. Uh. <laughs> At the end of that, I was going to go man in the mirror. I mean, when you're taking a leak. You got to look at yourself in the in the, every morning. I don't know that he ever did that. I don't know that he ever did take a look at himself in the mirror. I think he was quite content with his money, and his money was, you know, money was huh. everything. You know, I a he he on a, a on a lot higher octave, but I can't do it. Can you do the the he he? Oh, of course I can. As well as the moonwalk, or I, I've never been able to moonwalk, but I can do it. I'll do a hee hee because there's 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 several in the audience going, please don't do that, and there's several going, please Tony do a hee hee, and if I don't, I'm going to get emails going, could you please send me a hee hee? So there you go. You know that brings back memories because usually I have my phone on vibrate now or silent, but yeah. back in the day when you could customize your ringtones <laughs> and your your text message notifications, and that was really fun. You know your you're in class yeah. and all of a sudden NSYNC's bye bye bye. <laughs> you just you just let it go to voicemail because you don't not want to hear it. And my text message notification, because on some phones you can actually record your own and then customize it. Yeah. That's what my text message notification is. But I never have my phone on loud. It's always on silent. I so I think what, today I'm gonna go retro. I'm gonna turn my phone on and then I'm gonna text myself and it's just gonna nonstop hee hees. I um I remember did I did was was he he specifically for me or was yes. it like everybody okay yeah no it was a I didn't I didn't go that <laughs> that you you want to talk about a pandemic and so what have you done the last four months well I painted my garage I put in new carpet I went through all 234 <laughs> contacts in my phone and gave them each their own text <laughs> message notification <laughs> it's something to do. <laughs> The thing is, uh, and we are wrapping up the show, um, but uh, the uh, years ago, 20 years ago or so, there was a Christmas party. Um, I think I, I, I performed this somewhere else, too, but I don't remember where. Maybe you do. But um, uh, Michael Jackson was making a comeback uh, in the year 2000. Uh, and, uh, there was an album that he had, it came out with. And I, I believe I performed a song of it, like at the karaoke at our Christmas party at the radio station. And I got like a standing ovation. It was, it was very well received. Uh, and <laughs> of course, anything that's very well received in my world, it equates in my brain to do more of it, do more, do more. People love it. Do more. And, um, I subsequently have made other Michael Jackson performances, discovering I can do a pretty damn good Michael Jackson at karaoke. So much so that on my honeymoon, uh, on the we were out, took a cruise to New England, and on the uh, the cruise ship there was a karaoke night, and uh, I went up uh, and did "Man in the Mirror," and Jen was watching from uh, the balcony up above. And uh, at first I was getting like kind of booed uh, because I was, you know, this, you know, white guy going up there doing Michael Jackson. And uh, 
And I'm like, it's Michael Jackson. You know, everybody loves Michael Jackson, or they did before everybody knew all the horrible shit uh, and allegations. And um, I, uh, I did uh, Man in the Mirror, and and then uh, you know it starts out really kind of soft, and it was going good. And then people were like, they stopped booing, and they started like listening. And by the and then Jen didn't want to see me get booed, so she walked away and went to the bathroom. And the the performance when it really kicked in and you really had it going, or I really had it going, I had the whole room like cheering and clapping, and I got a standing ovation. <laughs> and then I walked off stage and to find her, and she's coming out of the bathroom. I'm like, did you see that? Did you see that? And she's like, I went to the bathroom. I didn't want. I didn't. I didn't like it when people are are being negative towards you. I'm like negative. I had the whole room like cheering. <laughs> and who were the initial booers? I don't know. Some drunk people sitting there at the front of the. You know, it, it was in the you know cocktail lounge or whatever on the celebrity summit or more whatever the hell. More Billy Joel. Yeah. More Billy Joel. Play Skinnerd. You know, but uh, it was it was quite uh, it was quite a performance, and I, I've done Michael Jackson uh, performances every now and then when there's karaoke. Uh, and I believe my parents are attempting to make it here to see us for the first time in like a year. And it was brought up last night that uh, where is the karaoke machine? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Uh, so I got to probably try and find that here somewhere today because my parents like karaoke um, uh, to an unhealthy level. So <laughs> that's probably going to be in the near future for me here as we uh, quarantine and do uh, Michael Jackson karaoke on my farm with my parents, uh, which who would have thought that would be a sentence 365 days ago. <laughs> so that wraps up uh, today's episode of the dark side of Wikipedia. If you like the show, leave us a review on Apple podcasts or wherever you get podcasts, please press subscribe as well. For Sean and all of us at the dark side of Wikipedia, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.